had a lady come into my clinic today who had arthritis and she looked kind of distraught. And I thought, oh, must really be hurting. I asked her about it and she told me that she was, uh, that she had a birthday. And I'm like, well, I guess as we get older, none of us really like birthdays, so maybe that's what's going on. And then she told me that uh, she was hoping to get a new car because she hadn't had a car in 10 years and her car was kind of falling apart. So she was leaving little hints around the house for her husband and whatnot. And one of the hints she left was that she, you know, really wanted something that would go from zero to 200 really fast. So <laughs> comes the uh, birthday, she gets a package and she opens it. As she's opening it, her husband goes, honey, that's a thing I figured that would go the fastest from zero to 200. She gets it open and it's a vacuum scale. <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't very happy. <laughs> so the other thing that I hope to do today is I want to talk a little bit about what arthritis is. Because a lot of people have a misunderstanding of what the word actually means. And then throughout the press, um, you may have heard about a lot of different things that supposedly cure arthritis, this, that, and the other thing. I hope to shed some light on, on what we think is the real truth um, with, when it comes to that. So I do hope to expose some of the hoaxes. Uh, I hope I can explain what arthritis is and, and what some of the valid treatments are. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, Without ado, we'll get started. So what does arthritis really mean? When somebody says they have arthritis, all it really means is that you have an inflammation of a joint. The word arthro really means joint, and anything that ends in itis means inflammation. So you can have bursitis, which means inflammation of a bursa, all right? Tendinitis, inflammation of a tenda, tendon. Arthritis means inflammation of a joint. So that's all the word really means, is inflammation of a joint. So just as if someone said, well, I, I have cancer. Well, what does that mean? Is it breast cancer? Is it colon cancer? Is it uterine cancer? I mean, it's a big word that encompasses a lot of different things. So saying you have arthritis doesn't really tell you much other than that you have inflammation of a joint. It's a generalized term, okay? So there's rheumatoid arthritis, there's osteoarthritis, there's psoriatic arthritis, there's actually over a hundred types of arthritis, okay? Today we're gonna to talk about the most common ones. I'm not gonna to try to make you an orthopedic surgeon and learn all 100 different arthritis, okay? So arthritis results in the destruction of normal, healthy cartilage. So that's something I really do want you to remember. Arthritis destroys the cartilage in the knee. Cartilage is the gristle. If any of you, most of us have some farming background in North Dakota and help you know, either parents or grandparents butcher cows, pigs, or whatever, and you know the ends of the joints are made of cartilage, right? The gristle, if you want to call it that. Arthritis attacks that gristle, and it's the loss of that normal, healthy cartilage that accounts for pain, deformity, and loss of function. So I often have people come into my office and say, hey, doc, can't you just take that arthritis out of my knee? And the answer is no. Because arthritis is the loss of something. It's the missing of normal healthy cartilage, right? So you can't take out what you're missing. <laughs> so you, that's why I'm explaining it to you this way. So no, you can't take arthritis out because it's missing normal healthy cartilage. Does that make sense? Okay. So <clears throat> the answer is no, you can't just scrape out the arthritis. So this is what an arthritic joint looks like. Here's a schematic over here, and here's an actual picture from a uh, surgery we did. And the picture's not the best, but this is actually bare bone. This over here is cartilage. So this person has worn out the cartilage all the way down to bare bone on this side of the knee, and that side of the knee still looks pretty good. So in the schematic, you can see where you have bare bone here in several different areas, and that's what, that's actually what happens at the end stage of arthritis, okay? So what does an x-ray look like? So on this side, that's a pretty normal, healthy knee. The bone all looks good, but the space between the bones is what we're really looking at when we look at arthritic joints. If you look at this knee, there's no space between the bones anymore. That's called the cartilage space. So this person on this side 
has bone on bone arthritis. They completely mourn through the cartilage and they're rubbing bone against bone. Okay? So, can arthritis be cured? That's a great question. And as of now, we don't think there's any cure for arthritis. Arthritis is a progressive problem and it's going to worsen with time in general. The progression of some types of arthritis can be slowed, but the progression of most, the most common type of arthritis is what we call osteoarthritis. It's also known as wear and tear arthritis. Um, and that cannot be altered. So if you have rheumatoid arthritis, there are new medications out that can actually slow the disease and even sometimes halt it, but there is no absolute reversal or cure, okay? And osteoarthritis, no. There's just ways to take care of pain, but we don't have a cure. So here's some myths. I hear these beliefs and myths all the time, so I'd like to just get them out in the open and we can talk about them later if you want. For instance, I wore out my knee because I had to work so hard when I was young, okay? Well, it turns out that people that sit behind the desk and people that have been pampered their whole lives <laughs> get arthritis just as hard as us hardworking North Dakotans who grew up on farms having to stack bales all day. So unfortunately, we can't say that it was the fact that our folks made us work hard and we were little that made our, our knees arthritic. Um, my obesity isn't the cause of my arthritis. My being overweight isn't the cause of my arthritis because I know a real skinny guy that has bad arthritis and he got it, so it must not be related to my weight. Well, that's not logical thinking. Avoiding gluten will prevent arthritis. I've heard that. There's no relationship between gluten allergy and arthritis at all that we know of. Um, I avoid exercise because I don't want to wear my joints out. Turns out that exercise is actually healthy for your knee. Um, diet has no effect on arthritis. Well, that's not true. We know that, that the cartilage cells and the bone and all needs the proper nutrition in order to get the elements they need to, to do what those cells do. Taking calcium will help my sore joints. Calcium is good for bone, but it doesn't do a thing for cartilage. And remember, the lack of normal cartilage is what arthritis is all about. So no, calcium won't help. But I've heard people claim rum-soaked raisins and grapefruit and eggplant and other nightshade vegetables will cure arthritis. I don't think so. Ginger, turmeric, and other spices can cure it. People have those beliefs, but there's no scientific evidence. And then cracking your knuckles or popping a joint will cause arthritis. My mother used to tell me that, but my dear mother is wrong. <laughs> All right? Some truths about arthritis. It is the number one cause of disability in the United States. That's a big statement. 50 million Americans carry the diagnosis. 300,000 children, believe it or not, have arthritis. And aerobically active adults, that's people that are exercising, people at the Y here, um, uh, slow a short progression of arthritic disease than people that sit around. So actually, when I told you earlier, the person that blamed that hard work on their arthritis, it's the opposite. It's people that sit around that actually get arthritis worse. In the 1960s, arthritis was the number one reason elderly folks were in institutions, nursing homes. Okay? It wasn't Alzheimer's like today. It was arthritic disease. Well, there's hardly anybody institutionalized anymore because of arthritis. So we've come a long way in treating it. Risk factors for uh, knee and hip arthritis include genetic history is number one. And that's one thing we can't do anything about. We may love our parents, but they passed on certain things to us. And if you have a genetic propensity to develop arthritis, you can't do anything about that. You can do something about it if you're really overweight. Smoking, you can do things about Previous trauma is uh, another issue that leads to arthritis. If you bang up your knee in a car accident, you hurt your knee badly, you're more likely to get arthritis in it later in life. So there's both operative and non-operative treatments for arthritis, and they've all improved significantly over the last 10 years. So let's talk about obesity a little bit. If you look at this back truck here, look at the tires on that. If you Take this size tire and you put it on that size of a truck. They're not going to last as long, are they? So it depends on your physiology and your bone size. If you're really not meant to be that big and you're putting a Mack truck on Volkswagen tires, it's going to wear out faster, isn't it? It's really that simple. It doesn't have to be any more complicated than that, okay? So if you're really overweight, losing weight will help your knees quite a bit. Um, alternative arthritic treatments. We hear a lot about these. 
acupuncture, prolotherapy is one, pulsed electronic magnetic fields, copper, um, even uh, Brett Favre talks about the copper thing. Uh, we know people that claim that in Sedona there's vortexes that somehow heal arthritis, Tai Chi and yoga. Those are all good things to keep you active and healthy, but they don't cure arthritis. Um, nutraceutical treatments. We had people, it seems like I've been, I've been doing this for uh, nearly 30 years now. And I kind of went through a phase where in my early 90s, when I first started my practice, people were eating shark cartilage left and right, thinking that it would somehow regenerate cartilage. That fad kind of came and went. Then we went through the glucosamine era, which um, may have some benefit, believe it or not, in um, animals. A lot of veterinarians actually prescribe this. In human beings, the studies haven't been quite that good. However, I do know some people that absolutely swear by this stuff. Um, the, the scientific evidence hasn't proven that it really works, but I have patients that take it and they swear about it, so I can't argue with that. The turmeric and ginger, turmeric has been known to help with some inflammation, but whether it really does any good for arthritic or not, SAMI is S-adenosomethacine. That's another alternative medicine. It helps with inflammation and can help with pain. Uh, people have even taken bone broth and proteolytic enzymes, one that's named here, to try and cure arthritis. Um, what I want you to know, and what troubles me as a surgeon is, I think there's some feeling out there amongst a subgroup of people that feel that um, there really is a cure out there, but we're just not letting you know. <laughs> okay, it's like there's some sort of a conspiracy. If you guys cured your arthritis, you'd never get to do any surgery, so you won't really tell us how to cure this. And it's just nonsense. I mean, I would give you whatever treatment works. I could care less if it comes from a pharmaceutical manufacturer, or whether you can grow it in your own backyard. I really don't care. What I care is getting things that really do work, that's proven scientifically, and if there is such a thing, and it's not made by a pharmaceutical company, I'd be the first one to recommend it to you, okay? So there is no underculture background of people that are trying to hide cures for these various things, but believe it or not, I see people in my office every day who really do think that there's a cure out there and we just won't give it to them. So if there is, I am unaware. Um, so um, moving on, what is stem cell therapy? Everybody's heard about it now. It's the new hot subject that everybody wants to talk to when they come into my office. So let's talk a little bit about it. These are live human cells that are immature. Think of them like teenagers, okay? And these little teenager cells, they haven't figured out what they want to be when they grow up yet. So they're, they're young. They have not yet differentiated into mature cells. So they haven't figured out whether they're going to be doctors, plumbers, lawyers, work at the YMCA. They don't know what they're going to be. So these cells are basically waiting for some external factor to signal how they're going to differentiate when they grow up. So it's a two-stage process to do a, a, a stem cell a transplant. You have to harvest the cells either from fat or from bone marrow. The cells that are harvested from fat, there's only one in a hundred thousand of those cells that they harvest that are actually stem cells. Okay? Bone marrow, it's a lot harder to get and it's a lot more painful to get but the, the number of stem cells you get from a bone marrow aspiration are a lot more than you get from fat. So bone marrow has been used as well. And you should know that the Fed Food and Drug Administration hasn't really approved any of these treatments yet. Okay? So but what they did is they took these stem cells and they injected them into these arthritic joints in hopes that these cells would somehow figure out how to make new healthy cartilage. So they injected them in hopes that these teenagers would figure out that when they grow up, they're supposed to be cartilage cells and make cartilage, okay? All right. Here's the problem though. When you, in, it, it, it's, it's a very basic and, and almost crude idea of what's going on inside of a joint. There's, there's two factors inside of a joint that makes, in my opinion, stem cells not so favorable. One is, there's a mechanical problem with most knees. They're either bow-legged, knock-kneed, something is mechanically wrong. It's not just a physiologic problem, 
It's an external alignment problem. It's an engineering problem. So you're either like this, you've seen people bow-legged. Those things exist in arthritis, right? And injecting cells inside that joint is not going to change that relationship. So when I showed you that big Mack truck earlier, if that Mack truck doesn't have the front end alignment, they're going to wear out the tread on the inside of the tires or the outside of the tires, right? So putting new tires on a truck that has no map, that doesn't have a front end alignment, you're going to just wear out the inside or outside tread again. The same is true of these knees. If they're bow-legged or not knee, and you inject stem cells into them, does it have a chance? No, because you're still crooked, right? They don't all of a sudden straighten out a crooked leg. So that's one thing you've got to think about. But number two, ask yourself, why did this knee get arthritic in the first place? The reason is it's a hostile environment. These knees are full of these enzymes that are chewing away at your cartilage. So injecting stem cells in there doesn't change that harsh environment. It's going to continue because it's a genetic problem, right? So putting a stem cell inside this terribly arthritic joint with all of these enzymes that are in there attacking cartilage, they don't just stop because stem cells came in there. They keep doing their thing. So stem cells really don't have much of a chance in most situations. There are a few, and I totally agree with the people that are doing research on this. It needs to be researched, but I'm telling you, it's not ready for prime time at this point. In fact, our attorney general asked the one stem cell company that was in North Dakota to leave because of the false advertising they were doing. They actually got kicked out of North Dakota, okay? So, um, however, I think the research is good, but to sit here and tell you we have a cure using stem cells, that's, that's a huge leap of faith. That's, that's just not true, okay? So, um, we're rushing to market to, to, to really have an unproven technology. It's not FDA approved and it's not paid for by your insurance. Um, there's no well-documented research pro providing any long-term success of these treatments and clinics are popping up all over America with false claims and false promises that can't be fulfilled, okay? If they work, I could do it. I'm a licensed physician. If I wanted to do stem cells, I could do it. I choose not to because it doesn't work yet. They're working on it though. Someday it might. So another 10 years from now, if I give a lecture, I may change my tune. But as of now, it's not working. So um, I don't think I need to beat that horse anymore. Prolotherapy is another type of thing that's been done a lot. And it's basically injecting the knee with various irritants. Sugar water, glycerol, phenol, that's a type of an alcohol, um, platelet-rich plasma. All these things have been injected in the knees with the hope to initiate some sort of an inflammatory and healing response. Um, that is met with uh, mixed success. You'll hear an anecdotal person here and there say that it, that it helped them, but for the most part, it, it hasn't worked out so well so far, okay? A team of doctors, uh, a Medicare physician, who, review panel looked at these kinds of treatments and they concluded that no specific evidence-based data had been presented in favor of the effectiveness of this treatment. In other words, it doesn't work. Non-operative management arthritis, one thing we do, we know that weight loss helps and I told you why. Um, bracing can help. So if you have an arthritic knee that just hurts on one side and you have one particular activity that tends to really bother it, let's say you love riding a horse. You get on most of your day and it doesn't hurt so bad. But when you get on that horse and you love to ride it, it just really hurts. Well, that kind of person would be willing to wear a brace because they don't have to wear it all day long. They're allowed to do their activity, which is usually only, you know, you get on a horse, you're not, normally you're not riding for more than a couple hours. I know that some ride longer, but, but you're willing to put that brace on for that period of time because it allows you to do an activity you love. Most people that have to wear it all day long are not willing to wear a brace. They end up taking them off, throwing them in the closet, and not wearing them because they have to constantly fuss with them. The Velcro straps tends to slide down the leg a little bit. I have a gentleman who actually plays racquetball here, and his knee really hurts then, and it doesn't hurt at other times. He's more than willing to strap on a brace to go ahead and play his racquetball game. That's a good use for a brace. Um, Non-impact exercises actually brings nutrition to cartilage cells. 
So the exercises on the ellipticals, <laughs> treadmills, as long as you're not running, uh, swimming, biking, those are all good exercises for knees. Physical therapy can help sometimes. Assistive devices, cane, crutches, walkers, they definitely take a load off the leg. Um, and then of course medications. The problem with medications is they all have side effects. So there's no free lunch, right? If you take anti-inflammatories, they can certainly help with the pain, but then you run the risk of having a, a gastric upset, uh, even stomach bleeding sometimes, raise uh, your blood pressure a little bit. And, and over a long time, they can even hurt your kidneys. So um, the other non-operative management of knee arthritis, the thing that's been done for a long time is steroids. Um, there's newer slow release steroids even that are safe for people with diabetic diabetes because you know steroids can increase the blood sugar sometimes. So they even have newer ones out that are safe for diabetics to take. They're highly effective, but they lose effectiveness over time. So the first time you get a steroid shot, the chances are that it's going to be the, the most effective. I have people come in to my office and say, you know, that shot you gave me really worked well. And then I went home and had my local doctor give me a couple, and they just never worked as good. Well, it wasn't the doctor at home's fault. It's the fact that I had the best chance of helping because I gave the first one, okay? The first shot's going to help more than subsequent ones. The first one, better than the second, better than the third, the third better than the fourth, and so on. So highly effective, but uh, it does lose its effectiveness over time. And it is the most powerful anti-inflammatory we know. So arthritis means inflammation of the joint. The steroid is the most powerful anti-inflammatory, okay? Hyaluronic acid also comes from uh, rooster comb. People refer to it as a rooster comb shot. That's a lubricant. So think of a, a worn out knee like a bad ball bearing. You can put more grease on it. It doesn't make the ball bearing not bad anymore, but it might get you by a little bit until you can get a new ball bearing. Well, that's the kind of the theory behind the hyaluronic acid. It's a lubricant. It doesn't cure arthritis, but it sometimes can get people by for a while. Okay? All right. So what are some operations that can be done? Everybody just jumps right to total knee replacement, but I'm not here to tell you. There's a lot of other things that can be done in the right situation. You can realign a crooked joint. Like I just said, many of these folks have terribly bow-legged knees or not knees. Those could be realigned, and just that realignment alone can help out a lot. Can do it with an osteotomy is a fancy word for meaning breaking the bone and realigning okay arthroscopy can sometimes help there's cartilage transplant surgeries that are done and then there's a what they call the washout surgery remember i told you there's all these harmful enzymes inside the joint that actually go and attack the uh, uh, cartilage cells well the thinking is you can wash those out and then uh, delay advancement of arthritis. It doesn't cure anything, but it can help, okay? So here's a realignment procedure. This, is, this person has been riding a horse their whole life, it looks like, right? Way bowling. Well, you can actually go in and break the bone down here and realign this, as we did here, and that balances the knee out. So if, in this type of a knee, all the pressure is going on the bad part where you're going on bone. Well, if you realign it, it redistributes the forces across both sides of the joint. So it's not just on the inside and not just on the outside. It's more of a balanced situation. What, what um, keeps the bone in place there? Do you put a rod or what? Do you... This little wedge here uh -huh. is, and, and when we do this, this wedge actually holds everything open to where you want. It's actually a, a, a bone wedge. It's made out of artificial material that actually turns into bone <coughs> over time. So we just actually cut the bone through here, and then we wedge it open like a pipe, okay? And then we stick that in there, um, and that's what holds it open. And then it heals like that. So the first six weeks, you gotta not put all your weight on it, but after that, it's strong enough to allow you to put your full weight on it. One nice thing about this operation is if you're a real active person, and you, let's say you like to look downhill ski, or you're a mountain climber or something like that, this operation will allow you to go back to do those kinds of things. Whereas after a knee replacement, you probably shouldn't do those kinds of things anymore, okay? Um, here's another realignment procedure that we did. This is a, a person that uh, was actually the opposite, a little bit knock-kneed, like you see here. 
and we did the realignment on this side of the bone, and you see how nice and straight they are afterwards, okay? So that can be done. So the realignment is basically uh, reserved for people less than 40 with early stage arthritis, and they do best with realignment procedures. There's a period of crutches for six weeks, which nobody likes, but that's the price you pay if you have that operation. <clears throat> Arthroscopic procedures, everybody wants an arthroscopy because it's so easy. There's three little poke holes in your knee. It takes about a half an hour to do the procedure. You're only on crutches for a couple of days. And it's easy compared to many of the other surgeries. The problem is the results are pretty unreliable. And cartilage transplants really aren't indicated for arthritis. Okay, cartilage transplants are best indicated for a traumatic type event. So if a young person's in a car accident and they happen to hit their knee against the dashboard and they happen to knock off a chunk of cartilage, this kind of procedure would be good for that. Okay, um, arthroscopic debridement or what we call the washout procedure really hasn't been uh, effective or reliable. People get better but for a short period of time. As you know, any surgery is expensive anymore. And to do this kind of a surgery, to hope that somebody gets three to six months worth of uh, relief out of their pain, probably isn't justified anymore um, with insurance companies. And I'll talk a little bit about microfracture techniques. In fact, right now. So this is a person, like I said earlier, who is missing this chunk of cartilage. The white stuff you see here is normal, healthy cartilage. The area right here in the middle is bare bone. So they knocked off the cartilage on the end of their femur bone. So right in here is where that picture is showing, all right? And when that happens, there's a technique that we can try and get some new cartilage to grow in there. We drill these little holes in there, um, and that stimulates uh, bleeding. And when something bleeds, it can actually form a scar, and that scar can actually form cartilage over the end of the bone. So the next picture I show you will be what it looks like afterwards. So that's the same knee with that new cartilage that grew over. It's not as good as the cartilage you were born with, but it's it's not it's a lot better than bare bone, right? Um, so joint replacement. Um, let me talk a little bit about joint replacement. I really don't like the word joint replacement when it comes to the knee because it sounds like we cut your whole knee up. It sounds like we chop here and chop here and just take that out and put a whole new knee in. And that's not what we do at all. A knee replacement should be called a knee resurfacing. If I had my druggers and I could go back to 1972 when the first knee replacement was done, I would tell the guy, don't call it a knee replacement, call it a knee resurfacing. When you have a chipped tooth and you go to the dentist and he caps that tooth, does he call it a tooth replacement? No, right? Well, we're not replacing the knee either. We're resurfacing the knee. So what's done in a knee replacement is we shave off the end of the bone, it's arthritic, and you cap it with artificial parts, okay? All right, so again, we do not replace your entire knee joint, but the name stuck, so that's what we call it. Um, uh, all that's really replaced is a very thin segment of bone, about a quarter of an inch is all, that's shaved off, and um, the new artificial parts are actually glued onto that bone. There's also some new ones that aren't glued upon, but uh, most of them are glued these days. So when you talk to an orthopedic surgeon like myself, we actually think of the knee as three different joints. We think of the kneecap as one joint, we think of the inside part of the knee as another part, and the outside as another part. So if just one of those three parts is arthritic, why would you replace the whole knee? So there are things called partial knee replacements, okay? So here's a total knee. This is one that has the entire proximal tibia replaced and the distal femur, okay? This is made out of plastic, so you get a new bushing. So these parts are all highly polished, nice and smooth, um, unlike the arthritic knee that it replaced. So there's three components, and this picture doesn't show the kneecap, but the kneecap gets resurfaced as well. People often say, oh, you took out my kneecap cap and gave me a new kneecap. No, I didn't. I just shaved off the arthritis and cemented a little button on the back of it, okay? Um, of all the different kinds of, of replacement surgeries, the total knee seems to be the most reliable. It has the longest track record, and I think I can safely say that it's the most durable uh, of all the types of replacements. Um, 
Here's a patellofemoral replacement. So the kneecap here is replaced, but the other parts of your knee are still preserved. So all we did is give you that new button on the back of your kneecap. This kneecap is still you. It's just replaced the, the little part that we shaved off, and then the other part of the knee gets uh, replaced as well. This is a partial knee replacement, replacing just the inside <coughs> part of your knee. It's called a partial knee arthroplasty. You can also replace just the outside part if that's what's worn out. Okay? The reason to do a partial is because it feels more like a normal knee. So two thirds of the knee is still you, so all those nerves and tendons and all that feel more like a normal knee than a total knee replacement. Okay? Sometimes we'll put these in knowing full well that the knee is going to need a complete knee replacement. But this can buy you 20 years before you need that. So if you're a young person and you happen to need a knee replacement when you're in your early 40s or late 30s, this might be a good option uh, to buy you time until you get into your 60s or 70s. Okay? So that's done a lot. Um, the frequency of these procedures is increasing. Um, part of it's because I think our society demands a lot more. We want to keep active. So that's one reason, but the other is demographics. We're at the time now where um, most of us in this room are baby boomers, right? And we're at the age where we need these things, okay? I'm at the younger end of the baby boom thing. I was in 61, but, but you know, from what, 1945 on, um, all those people, there's a huge wave of people that, that need this kind of surgery these days. They're living longer also, which is another reason. The oldest person I ever did a knee replacement on was a 97-year-old nun. She lived out at the Priory. She loved to take a walk every day and say her rosary. And she was upset because she couldn't do that anymore. And I'm like, wow, do we really want to do a knee replacement on a 97-year-old person? And she kept bugging me. <laughs> I finally gave in. And she was as happy as can be. And she lived to be 103 before she died. So she was very happy. So um, my wife sitting in the back there will tell me all the time that age is just a number. So there is no age that you're too old to have this. And I learned from that person not to be so, I don't know if the right word's judgmental, but I'm a lot more open-minded to doing it on people even in their 90s, provided that they're healthy. If you're not healthy, even at age 50, I wouldn't do one, right? I mean, if you're gonna have heart attack on the operating table. I don't care if you're 25, you shouldn't be having a surgery. But if you're 90 and your knee's bad and you're otherwise healthy, and if my knee replacement keeps you in your home, keeps you out of the nursing home, keeps you independent, lets you go grocery shopping, why not, right? Um, plus, think about it, as expensive as a knee replacement is, it's a whole lot cheaper than being in a nursing home, right? Okay, so what's the future? Well, everybody's talking about robotics these days. I got a couple friends that want me to start using a robot, and I might give in someday and do that. Um, everybody likes to talk about lasers. They don't really help you so much in joint replacement. Computer-assisted surgery, we do think that can help us uh, align these knees. So part of my job when I do these is not to leave you bow-legged or not knee anymore. When I put a knee replacement in, I want it to be nice and straight again, right? So a uh, computer can help me do that job a little bit better. And we always are trying to be less invasive. The surgery I do today is not a whole lot different than what I did 20 years ago, except that it's more tissue friendly. I don't cut muscle, I work around muscles. I don't release all these ligaments. I, I lengthen them or whatever needs to be done, but it's a lot less aggressive, so it doesn't hurt quite as much as it used to after surgery. Having said that, knee replacement is, is a, you know, if you're going to do it, you really have to commit to it because it's not a quick fix. Most people get better. If you ask 100 people that have had a knee replacement, <clears throat> are you happy with it and would you do it again? Somewhere around 93 to 95% of people will say yes. Okay, I'm glad I did and I'd do it again. If you ask those same people, is it 100% normal? Probably only about 50% will say, yeah, Doc, it feels just as good as my normal knee. 50% are going to say, you know, it's better than it was, but it's not normal. It doesn't feel great. So it's not 100% by any means, okay? 
Um, other things that are being done are, are biologic things. We have a long way to go before that's ready for prime time. And, and you saw my bias on the whole stem cell thing. And I just want to emphasize that I'm not anti-stem cell. I'm for the research. I think it's great. But it needs to be done at proper places that are doing legitimate research. Not these charlatans out there trying to get you to come in to their fly-by-night clinic to have a stem cell injection. Okay? So legitimate places like the Mayo Clinic like um, Johns Hopkins, like Stanford, places that are doing real research absolutely deserve um, our support. And I think it's important that they do that. But if you go to those places, they're not going to promise you any results. They're going to tell you that this is experimental and we're trying to figure out what works and what doesn't, just like when you go have an experimental chemotherapy drug. They don't know for sure if it's going to work or not, but thank goodness someone's doing the research, right? So that's that's where my two cents is on the, the stem cell thing, okay? Um, what else? What things should you ask the doctor before you have surgery? Um, you should ask, how many of these do you do? Does the person doing it have a lot of experience? What's the infection rate in your hospital? One of the worst complications of one of these surgeries is getting an infection. Um, is the joint replacement the primary focus of your practice? In other words, is this really what you do for a living? Or are you kind of doing a little back surgery here, doing a little shoulder <laughs> here, working on the neck, maybe you do a knee replacement here and there? You want to go to somebody that really focuses on it. Um, and then what are the complications? And do you take care of your own complications? We have a few people around that do the joint replacement, but if something goes wrong, they're the first ones to send them somewhere else. Well, I think you're going to do these surgeries you should be in a position where you're well educated to take care of the complication okay um what else um is your hospital a center of excellence it's been shown numerous times in various studies that places that do a lot of them are better just like if you're a carpenter and you build cabinets all day you should be better at building cabinets than a carpenter that frames houses right if I was going to build a cabinet, I would want a cabinet maker type carpenter rather than a house framer to build my cabinets. Well, a hospital that does a lot of these should be able to do them better, and actually the research shows that that's true. Um, do you do some outpatient surgery? Um, that's kind of the new and up and coming thing. Do you have a team dedicated to joint replacement surgery? A couple folks in the back of the room here who are totally dedicated to our total joint program. That's what they do all day long. Okay, so that's the focus. Um, is your facility uh, registered by uh, CMS as an advanced joint replacement center? That's, that's a pretty hard thing to get in, and um, they don't just give that out to everybody. And does your facility at least do 1,000 joint replacements a year? I think those are important. There's our team. So you see my team in the clinic. Um, I got you doing these non-impact exercises for that sore knee right there so that would be biking is actually one of the best exercises you can do and that's really all i had i told you i wanted to save a lot of time for um questions but i'm sure there are some so i open the floor to you i'm here to answer any questions you might have yes sir is there such a thing as sympathetic effects from a surgery Sympathetic effects? No. Are you talking about this? Well, sympathetic I, nervous system? Well, I had um, arthritis in both knees. Yes. And then it said bone on bone. Right. I had the right knee done, and it was really wonderful. Okay. But, you know, it, it seemed that like, uh, some of the arthritic uh, effects that I had in my left knee seemed to disappear or something. Oh, okay. Yeah, now I get you. Okay. <laughs> I'm thinking of the sympathetic nervous system. Something totally different. Okay, so yes, your one knee was sympathetic for the other. I'm with you. Sorry, I'm a little slow. So, no, no, no. <laughs> so here's what probably happened. I see this quite often. So when you when you have two bad knees, your your worst one, your favorite, whether you really know it or not, you are, and your other one's doing a lot of the work. Once you get that fixed, and your bad knee can do its fair share of the work, it takes stress off of the other one, and it can feel better. So I have all kinds of people over the years that said, Doc, I want to get my one knee done. As soon as you can, I'm going to get my other one done. Sure enough, I'll fix their one knee, and it'll be 
10 years before they do their other one because they felt better. So yes, that happens all the time. Yes, ma'am. Um, I've been treated for, I'm just going to a um, physical therapist. Yes. And he told me I have a lot of fluid on my knee mm -hmm. and also in the back of my knee. Right. So is that, is that, can I, is that considered arthritis? Or? It, it certainly can. There's a few reasons you can get fluid in the knee. But if it's non-traumatic, meaning you didn't have an injury, and your knee's swollen, chances are pretty good that you have an inflammatory type of arthritis. All right? There are certain, just good old-fashioned osteoarthritis can do that. Most of the time, osteoarthritis is what we call dry. You don't necessarily get swelling, but you can. You may be one of those. There's a whole host of other things like gout and pseudo-gout and um, crystalline arthropathies, we call them that actually cause the joint to physically swell, uh, you're also under that big broad category of arthritis. Um, you could possibly have one of those as well, okay? And sometimes people have mechanical problems that cause swelling. So if you have a torn meniscus, for instance, that the cushion in your knee, if it's torn, it can irritate things enough to make your knee swell. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of reasons for knee swelling and arthritis is one of them. Mm -hmm. And the swelling in the back of your knee um, is also from that. that. That's called a Baker's cyst. Yeah. The swelling in the knee collects in the back. A guy named Baker called it a Baker's cyst. But it's not the problem, it's the result of the problem. So the cyst itself isn't the issue. It's the arthritis that caused the cyst that's the issue. Okay? So um, along the line with the Baker's cyst, is yeah. there just keep exercising and not worry about it? Or should it be drained? Or no, if, if you drain it, it'll come right back. Because once again, it's the result of the problem, and until you take care of the problem, the Baker's cyst will continue. So you can drain it, but it's going to come back, almost for sure. So there's two reasons you can have a Baker's cyst. One is arthritis, so the joint wears out, and the other is a meniscus tear. When a meniscus tears, it can tear like a trap door, so it can allow the fluid to leak out and collect in the back, but just like a trap door, you can't get back in, okay? So you could have one of those two things. The fluid has to go somewhere, okay? Sometimes it collects in the back of the knee, which we call a Baker's cyst. Other times people have a big swollen knee in the front. So it can do either, okay? And oftentimes, people will have both. People with bad arthritis will also have a degenerative meniscus tear. That's almost always true. By the time you get to bone on bone, by definition, you have to have worn all the way through the meniscus. So it is by definition torn. Okay? <laughs> Am I getting too complicated? <laughs> no, you just went over it because like, you treat it like this arthritis. Well, you have to, yeah, I mean, we have to actually see you get an x ray, and if the x ray looks completely normal and you've got this swelling in the back of your knee, the next step to find out why you have that swelling would be to get an MRI scan to see if you have a meniscus tear that's allowing the fluid to leak out of your knee and collect in the back. Right, but if you have bad arthritis on an x-ray, there's no need to go any further because you've got a good reason for it, okay? All right. Yes, ma'am. Oh. With grief, with, uh, my granddaughter dislocated her knee on a trampoline, okay. and now she has occasionally it dislocates again. Right. You know, is there, um, other than wearing a brace, um, is there anything that can be done for that? Yes. This is a traumatic injury, right? She hurt herself on a um, uh, trampoline, right? So, um, when people do that, this has nothing to do with arthritis, by the way, it's just an injury. But the kneecap is what actually dislocated. So the knee itself didn't really dislocate, the kneecap dislocated. So that's a little different. But when that kneecap dislocates, the ligament on the inside of the knee tears, okay? So even though you put the kneecap back, that ligament doesn't always heal. So sometimes you have to have a surgical procedure to repair that ligament back together so the kneecap doesn't keep going out. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yep, and a sports medicine specialist would be the 
guy to see for that kind of thing. Okay? All right. Yes, sir. I had my left knee replaced about five years ago, and it uh, hasn't turned out well. I sleep okay, but if I have a day where I'm on my feet a lot by the end of the day and limping, it doesn't swell up. Uh, but it's just, I can't kneel on it. Uh, it just kind of hurts, and as the day goes on, it hurts worse. It hurts worse. Yeah. And unfortunately, um, there are a percentage of people, like I said earlier, it's not 100%. I, like, I think my number of 93 to 95 is pretty accurate. So out of 100 people that have this, you're going to have five people to seven people just like this. They're not going to be happy with their result. So there's a whole algorithm of what I do if somebody comes into me with this problem. Okay. First of all, I need to rule out, is there any kind of an infection? And believe it or not, there's infections that can happen and it doesn't look infected at all. It's not red, it's not swollen, it's not warm, but it can still be infected. So one thing we rule out is an infection and there's ways we do that. The second thing we look at is, are all those components put in correctly? Because there's little subtleties. Are they rotated a little bit different than they should be? Um, all the things in there have to line up perfectly to have a happy situation. Um, there's a, a complication called arthrofibrosis, where scar tissue comes in abnormally quickly after surgery and kind of gets into that joint and, and makes it hurt more than it should. Um, that's kind of a, a genetic pre predisposition for certain folks to have those things. So there's a whole list of things that we have to go through and check off. Is it this? Is it that? Could it be that? We go through, and at the end of the day, we do all of those things and we still can't come up with a good reason um, and that does happen unfortunately we just have to say that you're one of those folks that just didn't get the result we were hoping for even though it was done correctly and that happens so by no means am I saying this is 100 percent okay and hips on the other hand um, don't seem to be that way hips are almost, the number's like 97% of people with a hip replacement are happy. So only three out of 100 would have any, have any issue with a hip, whereas 7%, almost twice as many people are unhappy with a knee. Still, the overwhelming odds are in your favor, 93% is pretty good, you know, but it's not 100%. So, yes? Um, I'm one of those ones that did go and check out the stem cell. Um, their vocabulary was quite a bit about um, cartilage. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they did take a couple x-rays and I had very little in one and it was pretty good in another. But right now where I'm at, I guess you you haven't mentioned cartilage a lot and they made it sound really really vital uh, how is that in reference to your replacement and maybe i don't have arthritis but maybe i do have arthritis my knee is trying to give out a couple times it hasn't done it but every so often i'll feel like I best not fall because <laughs> I can feel something jumping in there on my left knee. Right, and that's so I don't know where. Well, I mean, I could get the X-ray from you or whatever. Or certainly, check it you out. Do that if there was an MRI or anything done. We'd be anybody that does what I do would be happy to look at it. the The issue, as I said earlier, with stem cells, you know. Um, if you allow me to disagree with you a little bit, I think all I talked about was cartilage. That was the whole focus oh, of my okay. whole talk. Yeah, this is all about cartilage. That's that. all this is about. It's not about bone or anything else. It's about cartilage and okay. what arthritis does to it. Okay. So yeah, right. um, what I'm saying is when it comes to stem cells, you're, it truly is the, the, the arthritic knee is a hostile environment for cartilage. That's why it degenerates and gets bad with time. So there's all these things in the knee. Call them 
if you want to go back to ancient times, we can call it evil humors in the knee, okay? They're actually proteolytic enzymes, if you really want me to get into it, that go and attack cartilage and cartilage cells, okay? And they degrade it. So when you inject stem cells into that, you haven't gotten rid of that. Those enzymes are still there. They're still angry, looking for cartilage cells to go beat up on. And what you're doing, if you want to use that teenager analogy again, is you're taking this naked teenager and you're putting them in the Arctic. Yeah. You're putting them in sub-zero weather and expecting them to survive. It's not going to happen. It's a hostile environment. That knee is full of stuff that doesn't like cartilage. I was just, I, no, I'm not even going there. Yeah. With that. Right. I, I'm just saying I just right. checked it out. And the, but the point being that I was just, um, the arthritic portion of it. Now I know I've got it because I've got it in my hand sure. pretty much right now. And that's now. what I was saying. So I think maybe I've got something going on there. Right. And then you said well. something about your knee jumping or giving up. Yes. yes. Well, that's the other part of it. So I want to, let's go back to what I talked about a little bit because this needs to be clear. And I'm not sure I made it clear because it's not easy to understand. There's two things going on in an arthritic knee. One is a mechanical engineering problem. One is the, the shape of the knee. So what's jumping in there? It's an irregular piece of cartilage, most likely. Things aren't nice and smooth. So you can imagine how injecting stem cells doesn't, it's not like a, a belt sander. It's not gonna smooth that out, right? right? So that's gonna continue, and it's not gonna just selectively fill in the voids. Those cells don't know where to go. There's nothing that says, hey, this is a defect over here, so I'm gonna run over here and plant myself here and start making cartilage. It just doesn't happen that way. Mm -hmm. So the mechanical part is either the, the knock knee, the bow leggedness, or the big bump in the in the cartilage that's not right. So that's the mechanical or engineering problem. The physiologic problem is the enzymes and the cell biology that's all messed up as well. So you have two things. The best you can hope for with a stem cell injection is to try and address some of the physiologic parts but even those proponents of stem cells don't talk at all about the engineering part that they're totally ignoring. Well, a person like me, you've got to know about both if you're really going to treat the arthritis, mm -hmm. right? It's not just one or the other. Both have to be in harmony to have a happy knee. Okay? So, yes, sir. I tried stem cell transplants at a local clinic here. They weren't terribly expensive. Uh, they took the stem cells, they grew blood, they yep. spawned it injected it back in my right knee and left shoulder. I had about a half a dozen treatments and I can't say that I noticed any improvement. Yeah. I have a friend of mine that goes to a clinic in Mexico. He swears his yes. treatments are working. That's a good point. We should talk about that too. You, you name any treatment out there. I don't care whether it's lighting an incense candle or um, some big powerful magnet or whatever, you're going to find people that swear by it, right? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that these people are crazy or whatnot, but if you take a group of people and you really study them, the majority of people don't either don't have the problem they think they had and they got magically cured because it really wasn't the problem in the first place, <laughs> or the power of the mind is huge. And I mean, I have patients that I did knee replacements on and I'm sure they tell me it feels great because they think it should be great. And also, just think about normal things in life. If you go out and you spend $50,000 on a brand new car, and something goes wrong with it, you don't go around and tell everybody, yeah, I was a fool for buying this car. How dumb was I to buy a car? No, you kind of minimize it and you say, eh, it's a pretty good car most of the time. And eh, it still gets me around, but you don't go around and brag about it not working. <laughs> Especially if you got all that money you put into it, right? right. So, uh, I don't know. I think there's a... Uh, I'm all for science. I'm not anti this or pro that. I'm just, show me the science and it's just not there yet. Okay? So, yes, there's people that have taken shark cartilage and swore by that making their knee better. There's no science to prove it does anything, but they believe in it. I actually had a lady from Boise who squirted WD-40 on her knee and she swears it made it better. Who am I to argue with? That's honestly, that's true. I 
have other people that wear poultices with garlic and stuff that swears that it makes their arthritis better. What do you want me to do? <laughs> I'm not going to argue with you. Put, put the garlic on then. I don't know. Come over to my house. I'll make dinner for you. <laughs> Take some of the garlic and put it to good use. No. <laughs> but, so that's, that's, you know. All right. Yes, ma'am. How long does an artificial knee last? Like, good question. If I have it done, does it need to be redone? Can it's it possible. The modern knee replacement, when I first started, I, I was got out of residency when I was 92, something like that. I told people back then that you could expect a knee replacement to last about 10 years. Today, I think it's realistic that you can get 30 years out of this, okay? And the reason is the materials we use are that much better, okay? The plastic part was the weak link in the knee replacement. Remember I showed you that plastic part that sits between the two metal pieces? That was the weak link, okay? That has greatly improved um, over the last 15 years. It was about 2001, 2002, somewhere in there, they came up with what they call highly cross-linked polyethylenes, and those are much more durable than the previous generation. So, yeah, and there are constant, you know, we talk a little bit about, um, I don't wanna go into the debate about cemented knees versus uncemented knees, but once the bone grows into these things, um, it can actually make them quite stable for the rest of your life. So one of the one of the modes of failure was loosening. The other, you can have wear, you can have loosening, um, you can have infection. Those are all things that could cause your knee to fail. Well, of those, the main one that used to be the cause of failure was the plastic wearing out. Okay, and I think we got that problem pretty good. Okay. All right. Yes, sir. Is uh, arthritis related to some uh, the weather and it gets cold? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh -huh. You know what? I have decided I'm not smart enough. In my younger years, I was so arrogant, and I'd say, oh, no, it doesn't. But after being in practice for 26 years, I think, I've come to the conclusion that, yes, I believe there is a relationship, but I'm not smart enough to have figured out why. So I do believe that. I mean, to be honest with you, I'll share my own story. I've got a little arthritis in some of my joints, and I can tell in these cold days, February was a miserable month, right? When I go to Arizona, I feel a little bit better. Things are a little bit looser, and, but why? I don't know. I really don't know why. Yeah, that could be. That could be. There's something, one guy had a theory that it had something to do with parametric pressure too, but I'm not sure that that's really been proven or not. So. Yes, sir. There's one other element we all that we haven't talked about, and that is your preparation for the surgery that's gonna take place. Right. Because the doctor told me, he said, the better you are in physical condition when you have this operation, the more success you're gonna get. Oh, we? What we need to do, my talk today was about arthritis. What I need to do is come back and have a talk to you about total joint replacement. When I give that talk, if you want me to someday, I'll be happy to talk about that because you're absolutely dead on correct. The health of the person needs to be at its optimum before surgery. 20 years ago, we did these surgeries and Basically, we sent people out to have a preoperative physical by their doctor, and basically that physical just said, yep, the person's gonna survive the surgery. But that, that's not good enough. We need to do more than just listen to your heart and lungs and say you're okay. We need to optimize everything about you. If you have COPD from smoking, we need to get your lungs in as good a shape as we can. If you've had a previous heart attack, we need to make sure that that's in as good a shape as can be. If you've had liver disease or kidney disease, we need to optimize every single part about you before we do an elective operation. So you are dead on correct, and I couldn't agree with you more. I just didn't talk about it. <laughs> All right. Is that it? Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. All right.